Today we'll continue on multi-threading, hoping to finish it, but probably not. There's a lot to do in multi-threading. But you know that you have some reviews to do. Hopefully you have not forgotten them. I'll keep reminding them. Mm. And people who are actually auditing the class and not do, uh, taking the class are doing the reviews. So people who are taking the class hopefully should be doing the reviews. <laughs> OK. Feedback on project proposals, probably you received them. Has everybody checked their email? OK, good. Let me know if you cannot read some of my handwriting. It's a lot easier for me to give you feedback in handwriting and then scan it and then send it to you. But sometimes uh, my handwriting is not as good as it used, it used to be when I was a kid. <laughs> uh, so I understand if you cannot read it. General feedback points. This is true for most groups, I think. Some of uh, concreteness was lacking in uh, many of the proposals. In some cases, there was too much concreteness. And you know who you are if that was the case. But even if it's not fully right, come up with some concrete mechanisms and get started right away. I know maybe you didn't write them fully in the proposal uh, because you were limited to two pages. But come up with those mechanisms and implement them. Uh, depending on whatever you're doing. If you're doing a model, come up with a concrete model and test it. Right? If, you're, uh, if you're trying to come up with a new cash replacement policy, come up with one and test it. And then use that as a starting point. OK? And let me know if you want to talk about it. I'll uh, and talk with Han as well. OK, last lecture we've covered asymmetry uh, in memory scheduling. And then we talked about. Uh, other use of asymmetry very briefly, and then we went into multi-threading. Hopefully everyone remembers we talked about fine-grained and coarse-grained multi-threading uh, after talking about general multi-threading first. Today we'll do more multi-threading. So hopefully people are excited about it. And some of it is on papers you've read. Well, this is wrong. <laughs> there you go. Do you know how to fix it? like that. <laughs> OK, well, these are some readings that uh, hopefully you're doing. These are in addition to uh, the readings you're assigned uh, to review. These aren't, you're, you're not supposed to review them, but we'll cover some of them. So we talked about fine-grained versus coarse-grained. Uh, just to warm you up, fine-grained is simpler to implement because you can eliminate a lot of the structures that are in there in the processor to do dependency checking, right? You can eliminate dependency checking logic. You can eliminate branch prediction logic completely. Of course, uh, the processor runs like a dog if, it's, if it has only one thread, because it's optimized for multi-threading. It's not optimized for a single thread. You could think of fine grade uh, at that, uh, from that point of view. You're really optimizing for having many threads. Whereas coarse-grained is less so, right? It's really, you can optimize the processor for having a single thread. But when that single thread stalls, you switch to another thread if one exists, right? So it's the opposite point of view. Uh, in fine-grained multi-threading, switching need not have any performance overhead. Again, you're optimizing the processor for multiple thread execution, so you should, you'd better switch very quickly. Uh, whereas coarse-grained requires a pipeline flush. You could, again, optimize this, but because of the mentality, you don't optimize it, right? You, otherwise, you need a lot of hardware to save pipeline stage and uh, switch to another thread. And usually, when you have coarse-grained multi-threading, uh, you can even optimize the register file path such that you don't need to have a big mux among multiple threads, right? Maybe you can do something else. When you're switching to another thread, you can reload the register file, right? Uh, reload the active register file. You can have uh, context register files and act reload the active register file when you're switching to another thread. And that takes time, of course. Right. Does that make sense? It's not a full switch uh, of a thread out of the processor, but you have these active versus uh, inactive register files, and you can switch between them. That way, the, only the active register file needs to be on the critical path. Right. So you're... Uh, Whereas in fine-grained multi-threading, all of the register files need to be active because you're switching between them every cycle. Right? Unless you have a mechanism of copying between multiple register files very, very fast without any overhead, uh, 
you cannot get the benefit of optimizing the register file that you could get otherwise with coarse grain multi-thread. So think about it from that point of view again. Coarse grain multi-threading, you optimize the pipeline for a single thread, and when that single thread stalls, you switch to another thread. And there is some support for switching to that thread quickly, so, but not as quickly as fine grain multi-threading. Okay, and this becomes this overhead of pipeline flush or switching to another thread uh, becomes larger with deep pipelines and large windows because you're throwing away more work. Of course, it doesn't become as large as not having support for multi-threading on the same chip. There's, of course, the disadvantage, again, with fine-grained is you get low single-thread performance because you've optimized for multi-threading performance. Okay, and we've covered some real machines that did this, uh, did coarse-grained multi-threading. Uh, we, we had covered fine-grained multi-threading machines also. And you remember Intel Montecito? Uh, and we, I think we left off on this slide. We talked about this slide also. Uh, when you share resources, uh, this is more true for coarse grain multi-threading, uh, but it's true for any kind of multi-threading. When whenever you share resources, space, uh, and time, you always uh, run into fairness considerations. Right? Fairness is not a problem if you have your de dedicated resource. But if you're sharing resources, now uh, threads make different progress because they may be utilizing those resources differently. When one thread needs it, the other thread may be using it. Right? In coarse grain multi-threading, one resource, uh, basically you're time multiplexing the pipeline across different threads. Right? And how much time is allocated to each thread determines both fairness and throughput. Fairness and system throughput. For example, when do you switch from one thread to the other? If switching has overhead, then that's a, there's a trade-off, right? When, for how long do you switch? When do you switch back? And how does the hardware scheduler interact with the software scheduler? Again, if you remember, we discussed very briefly, software scheduler assumes that these threads are running. Or, or is, it, is it true that the software scheduler actually assumes that these threads are running, right? That's, even that could be a question when you design a coarse grain multi-threaded system. What should the software assume when it puts multiple threads on these multiple thread contexts. In a fine grain multi thread system, the assumption is that hopefully all of the threads are making progress. In a coarse grain multi thread system, it's not so clear because the hardware is doing the switching. And the, if the software scheduler assumes that threads are both making equal progress, well, if the hardware doesn't guarantee that, there's some mismatch, right? So that's an interesting issue. And this becomes more complicated when you have priorities in hardware. So it's important to think about these issues. Uh, and what is the switching overhead versus benefit? That needs to be considered also. And where do you store the context is another issue when you design uh, such a system. Well, for example, you could store some of the context in the cache. You could carve out an area and you could store more contexts that way. Or you could dedicate more register files that are not active on chip, but they're, they're more costly. Okay, so some of these issues are actually discussed in this paper, which is a good paper. I didn't assign it this time because I assigned other papers. Uh, it's called Fairness and Throughput in Switch on Event Multithreading, which is essentially coarse grain multithreading. And they have this example where you have two threads. This is thread one running alone. It executes, it has large compute phases followed by some stalls for memory. And you have this thread two has small compute phases followed by some memory stalls. So this is much more memory intensive, thread two alone. When you put thread one and thread two together, assume that uh, a thread switch happens only when you get a cache miss. Um, is that true? I guess that's true, yes. Uh, switch, this is basically switch, on, switch only on miss kind of multi-threading. Thread one executes for a while, and then it switches because it gets a cache miss. And then thread two is switched in. It executes for a while, but it gets switched out quickly because it gets a cache miss very quickly. It has much more frequent cache misses. And then thread one executes again, and then switches only when it gets a cache miss, and then thread two executes. If you look at this, uh, is this schedule fair? If you look at the slowdown of the threads, thread one doesn't slow down that much, right? Because 
it's, it's still computing a lot. It's still occupying most of the resources of the uh, switch on event multi-threading pipeline. Whereas thread two is slowed down a lot. It has executed only two of these execute blocks in this same time. Whereas if it were running alone, it would have executed, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of these execute blocks. So you could do the calculation. This is slowed down by 4x, and this is slowed down by maybe 25%. So there may be some unfairness here, right? That's the problem. That switching policy determines that. How about switch? Uh, I don't know what happened here, but OK. PowerPoint is playing games on me again. <laughs> Let's see if I doubt that this will be fixed. This is a fundamental problem. <laughs> OK, so one, one thing you could suggest is switch not only on miss, but also when the data returns. Uh, I don't know if it will solve this problem. Probably not, right? Would it? So you would switch uh, when the data returns. I guess you could switch back to EX2. Now it becomes more complicated, right? The downside, the big downside with that policy is switching has performance overhead, right? It's not zero cost. You flush the pipeline. If whenever, the, whenever data returns, you switch back, then you keep flushing the pipeline. So all of the threads' performance reduces that way. Uh, and also, this is a problem with fine-grained multithreading also, but you get reduced locality and increased resource, resource contention in the cache if you switch too frequently. Because if you switch not so frequently, then the thread warms up its cache and executes in the cache without disturbance from another thread. So that's, that's an argument for coarser gain intervals. But the bad part of that is if you're getting cache misses once in a while, you really want to switch to tolerate the latency of those cache misses. So there is another uh, downside uh, trade-off between locality and uh, when you want to switch. Okay. So the solution that's proposed in this paper, which I like kind of, uh, because we had this, a similar idea <laughs> with the memory scheduling, what they did was they estimated the slowdown of each thread compared to when it's run alone. And they enforced switching when slowdowns be became significantly disparate from each other. That's the idea. They still did the usual switching on event, but they also enforced switching if one slowdown became significantly higher than the other slowdown. And they had a model of estimating the slowdown, of course. And the question is, how do you estimate the slowdown? Uh, of, of a thread when it's running together with some other threads compared to when it's run alone on the same pipeline. And this is a little bit harder in a, uh, in a coarse grain multi-threaded machine. Right? I guess you can think about it or you can read the paper about it. This is even harder in a simultaneous multi-threading machine. Right? But we, we will learn about simultaneous multi-threading soon because simultaneous multi-threading resources are always shared. In coarse grain multi-threading, you sometimes get the pipeline, you sometimes don't get. Maybe you can estimate that a little bit easily, a little bit more easily. And they took advantage of that in this paper. So I'd encourage you to read this paper. Uh, any questions? You can, maybe you can think of other solutions to this problem also. I think this is an interesting problem. Especially when you have many, many threats. How do you handle this issue? OK. So these things are actually real. So this is. Uh, not, maybe not to that extent. Maybe Montecito does not do slowdown estimation of the threads yet. But Montecito had these thread urgency levels. It's a fine uh, coarse grain multi-threaded processor. You, you could have a thread in the foreground and a thread in the background. Let's say you have T0 and T1. And you would flush the pipeline when you switch from the, uh, switch the foreground thread to be the, become the background thread. Uh, and there were eight urgency levels. Uh, nominal level was five, which means that the thread is actually making active progress. In this case, uh, these two threads initially are both making progress, uh, but only one of them can be executed because there's only one thread context. The other thread context is the background. And thread zero gets, gets, a, gets an L3 cache miss. What happens to its urgency levels, its urgency levels dec decremented. And there's logic that keeps comparing these urgency levels. If, and uh, the thread that has the higher urgency level is switched. It becomes a foreground thread. 
Make sense? Uh, OK, I guess let's see. You can, you can read this on your own. But there are cases where urgency levels change also. For example, they had a timeout mechanism to, to ensure that no thread does this, if you will. No thread occupies the pipeline for too long of a time. And after timeout, that urgency level became 7. So that thread became the most urgent thread. And when an external interrupt comes, they wanted to minimize the interrupt latency. I don't know actually if they took into account priorities of the interrupt, uh, but uh, they set the uh, urgency level to six, which is relatively high, right? So they would handle the interrupt service routine. And when uh, they, well, this I already told you, when you get a cache miss or some blocking operation, they would reduce the urgency level. Now you can read this. This is from the paper that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the McNary and Batia paper in IEEE Micro 2005 on Intel Montecito. It's a good read. Any questions on this? And you remember that they would also switch, they had also a software initiated switch instruction, right? You could add an instruction to software when you're blocking because you're waiting for a lock, for example. You would say, you would change the urgency level, basically, of the thread so that you could switch you could get switched out. Okay? So that's coarse grain multi-threading. And there, there are a lot of interesting research issues, I think, still in coarse grain multi-threading, especially if you want to have many, many threads on chip. How do you, how do, you do the scheduling on chip, and how, what is the abstraction you provide to the software to do the scheduling such that the software uh, mm, such that the software understands what's going on, first of all, and also uh, uh, is able to enforce its fairness policies, the higher level fairness policies, when the hardware is doing potentially something else. <laughs> this is actually an interesting topic. Uh, when, whenever an operating system schedules a task onto a processor, today the assumption is that task is making progress, right? But that task may be stalled. Whether it may be waiting for some other thread, it may be waiting for memory, and the operating system has no knowledge of this today. So if you think about it, if you're, uh, if you're creative, maybe you can find solutions to expose this to the operating system such that the operating system does a better job in scheduling. Right? This is something uh, that operating system writers no normally do not consider. The assumption is that when you schedule something, it just runs. All of that assumption, all of the fairness policies that are uh, designed in operating systems and scheduling today are, are based on that assumption, right? Which is not true, especially when you have multi-threading. Which is not true, especially when you have multi-core with shared resources and you don't guarantee progress in the shared resource. Okay. Okay, so let's move to simultaneous multi-threading. A lot of people uh, use simultaneous multi-threading, abuse the term. Uh, the term is abused because when they, uh, when they mean fine-grain multi-threading, they also say SMT. So when you, say, when you uh, hear SMT, it's simultaneous multi-threading. It means something specific. But people use SMT for fine-grain multi-threaded engines also. I've even heard people use uh, the term SMT for coarse-grain multi-threading. But that's wrong. So for example, uh, a good exam question could be, <laughs> is Sun Niagara fine-grain multi-threaded or SMT? <laughs> it's fine-grain multi-threaded. There is no SMT in San Niagara. But if you ask a lot of people on the street, well, I don't know about on the street. <laughs> you could try, I guess. <laughs> I don't know what, <laughs> what gobbledygook answer you will get <laughs> if you ask this question. <laughs> is San Niagara an SMT processor? Don't ask the MT part, because you'll confuse them. <laughs> if they're not already confused with SMT. Uh, if you ask that uh, to a person, you, probably the answer you would get is yes. And that's the wrong answer. <laughs> because Sun Niagara is not, S, is not an SMT processor. It's a multi-threaded, fine-grained multi-threaded processor. SM, and the differences we'll cover, we've already covered several times, I think. Fine-grained and coarse-grained multi-threading can start execution of instructions from only a single thread at any given cycle. Right. If you look at fine-grained multi-threading, if you look at the execution units, only one thread can be starting execution. And coarse grain, obviously, because 
there is only one third occupying the pipeline, right? But SMT, uh, well, uh, the downside is the execution unit that you're looking at or a pipeline stage that you're looking at, the utilization of that can be low if you have many of these execution units and if there are not enough instructions from a single thread to occupy all those execution units. So the, uh, well, of course, you need to have uh, multiple execution units for this to happen. If you have a single execution unit, then fine-grained multi-threading, assuming if you have enough threads, would maximize the utilization of that execution unit, right? But if you have multiple execution units, a thread may not have enough instructions to send to all of the execution units in, the in, in one cycle. So the idea of simultaneous multi-threading is to dispatch, some people would call it issue, uh, send instructions from multiple threads in the same cycle to keep these multiple execution units busy. So you can send, uh, start execution on multiple instructions in the same cycle from different threads. And this idea, I think I've given you the story briefly, but we'll take a look at it in a little bit more detail maybe. Uh, I think is one of the uh, first proposed uh, in this paper, which receives little credit for that, for good reason, uh, and also described in this paper, uh, but uh, the paper that actually coined the term simultaneous multi-threading is the best written paper among all of these and uh, more, much more clearly explained the terminology and you can see the timeline. Uh, and I would encourage you to look at this paper and figure out for, for, uh, for yourself what, ma what made that paper n have no impact or little impact. Okay. I guess I'll uh, pictorially show this a little bit. If you look at a pipeline processor, th and this is, let's say this box is one execution unit, and empty means it's not utilized, uh, colorful means some thread has an instruction executing on that execution unit at that point in time. Uh, if you have a pipeline processor, because you have data dependencies, you, don't, you, you may not be utilizing that execution unit, right, an adder. If you have some data dependencies, if the add is waiting for a load, then you may not be utilizing this adder. If you have a superscalar processor, then your utilization can go even, uh, become even less, right? Because now you're not trying to fill one execution unit, but you're trying to fill five, four execution units that need to be kept busy in parallel. Right. Does that make sense? So one way of utilizing these execution units, uh, how, how do you keep the execution units busy? Let's not go to fine-grained multi-threading. There are other ways also, right? Well, one thing, you could add no ops. You're essentially adding no ops here, right? <laughs> you could be executing garbage instructions. But that's not a good idea, probably. You won't gain much from that. You could uh, do something like predicate execution. This is one way of stretching uh, predicate execution. Uh, so hopefully you, you all remember what predication ex execution means, right? Basically the idea is you convert control dependencies into data dependencies. If you have a branch, you execute both paths. But one of them will definitely become a no-op, one path. So this does increase functional unit utilization for a useful purpose. It's not like no-ops only. Because if the branch is not correctly predicted, then you will use the path that you've redone, uh, you executed. You will always throw away one path, but you don't need to flush the pipeline. That's the benefit of predicate execution. You guys all remember this, right? Okay. There are other benefits to predicate execution, which you will tell me. Compiler can optimize the code much better, right? Because now you have, you eliminated the control dependencies. The compiler can move code, move instructions much more freely because it's limited by data dependencies only within that block of code. It's not limited by control dependencies. So there are other benefits of, uh, other than increasing functional unit utilization. So this is one way of increasing functional unit utilization, but some results are thrown away and uh, you may not actually occupy all of these units anyway. So if you look at a chip multiprocessor, multi-core, you could think of this pipeline, assuming equal resources, this pipeline being divided into two, right? and you have two threads executing, and functional units are partitioned across cores, 
but you still have limited functional unit utilization within a single thread, right? which means that you have limited single thread performance. You could have fine-grained multi-threading. You could combine these concepts also. But fine-grained multi-threading essentially does this. Instead of partitioning the resources across different cores, you're really partitioning cycles. You have one thread, and then switch to another, switch to another, switch to another. But you still have low utilization because of these dependencies, right? This thread cannot issue four instructions in the same cycle because the other instructions are waiting for something else right? that is not complete yet. So how do you fill these cycles? Basically, that's what simultaneous multi-threading does. This is a pictorial way of uh, looking at it. But for a given time, now you can have uh, functional units executing from different threads. Basically, you can, functional units can, can be executing at any given time. A functional unit can be executing independent operations from the same thread or from different threads. Make sense? And this slide uh, shows it in a different way. If you're, and now you, you need to orient yourself a little bit. Time was going this way before. Time is now going this way. Hopefully you can, <laughs> you can change your head like that too. I guess that'll work probably. <laughs> but this is the issue with, and this is time, and this is one functional unit, or uh, yeah, one, two, three, four functional units. This paper you read, maybe the earlier paper than you read, called it, uh, called a completely idle cycle a vertical waste. Right? You're wasting a, a, a full cycle vertically in this case. I guess it would be horizontal in this case, right? It's hard to wrap my head around in this vertical versus horizontal. But complete the idle cycle. When you have partially filled cycle, you waste horizontally. Right? So if you have a completely idle cycle, uh, you can if you have enough threads, you can cover that, right? So fine-grained multi-threading can actually cover that. But fine-grained multi-threading cannot fix the problem of this partially filled cycle. You could be executing uh, from a thread. So this, this happens in fine-grained multi-threading because you don't have enough threads, right? You can get a completely idle cycle. Uh, and if, the, if somebody tells you that, oh, I have a fine-grained multi-threaded machine, and in, in a given cycle, my functional unit is not busy, then what would you tell them? Add more threads to your machine, right? <laughs> and assuming you have, you have a problem with lots of thread parallelism, that should, uh, that should utilize, cover those completely idle cycles, eliminate those completely idle cycles. Right? But if somebody tells you that uh, they have a fine-grade multi-thread machine, and there are a lot of cycles where there's only one instruction that's executing out of those four execution units. Then you cannot tell them add more threads, right? Because fine-grained multi-threading just doesn't send instructions uh, to execution units from different threads at the same cycle. You tell them make your processor simultaneously multi-threaded. Right? Okay, so how do you reduce each? I think I've already told you these. And why is there horizontal and vertical waste? Well, data dependencies right, within a thread lead to this horizontal waste, partially filled cycles. And not enough threads lead to this completely idle cycles. Okay, so simultaneous multi-threading actually reduces both horizontal and vertical waste. Uh, re required hardware is, what do you need? The ability to dispatch instructions to functional units in the same cycle. The good news is that the existing out-of-order superscalar machines have that machinery, right? They can dispatch instructions from the same thread simultaneously into different functional units. But it doesn't need to be the same thread, right? Because what they do is they figure out the data flow, and instruction dispatch happens when the instruction becomes ready. And it doesn't matter whether you have single thread or multiple threads. If the instruction is ready, instruction is ready to execute. So uh, in, a, in an out-of-order processor, this is what happens. As long as dependencies are correctly tra tracked, then scheduler doesn't need to care about the threads, right? Does that make sense? 
So you can have multiple threads that have instructions in the window, in the scheduling window, or the reservation stations. And these instructions can be from different threads. Because the scheduling window, when an instruction finishes uh, its execution, that, it is, that instruction's result is broadcast to all entries in the window, right? And instructions that are dependent capture that value and become ready if both sources are ready. This has nothing to do with whether you're executing from this thread versus that other thread, right? If you already correctly link the instructions together, then you can keep the scheduler just as is and have the ability to wake up multiple instructions in the same cycle and select multiple instructions in the same cycle to send to multi, uh, different execution units. That's the realization. In an out-of-order superscalar processor, because you have this data flow engine, as long as you have kept your uh, dependencies correctly tracked, the scheduler doesn't need to know about threads. And you can keep the functional units busy using this machinery. <coughs> so the question is, how do you actually keep the data dependencies correctly? Well, this is a single-threaded, out-of-order, superscalar machine. And you remember, we, we have register renaming, right? So to be able to link consumer instructions to producer instructions, we did register renaming. And that register renaming needs to be done within a thread because threads do not share registers. So all you need is really, well, other than some other support, is to rename threads separately. Right? For each thread, you have a renamer. And each, thread, each thread's register dependencies are tracked independently. And each thread's instructions are renamed using this renamer. And of course, what, what, what other support do you need? You need, uh, of course, to, uh, you need to have the ability to fetch from different instructions, uh, different threads, different instruction streams, multiple program counters. And you can still share the iCache. Uh, renamer needs to be replicated because each thread has its own set of registers. And after that, not much really needs to be replicated, as you can see in this picture. You can just send the instructions down the pipeline, and hopefully they will complete. Even the retirement doesn't need to be replicated, right? Because when a thread's instruction is done, if it's the oldest instruction in the machine, then it just can be retired. You could optimize it. That may not be the best thing to do. You could have different reorder buffers for different threads, such that uh, threads actually do not uh, block each other, right? But nothing downstream really needs to be replicated, right? You don't need additional hardware. Does that make sense? In fact, you may not want to replicate some things. For example, the store load queue. If the threads actually are, one thread is storing to the same address another thread is loading from, you may want to do that bypass within that unified store load queue. Right? If you have shared memory. If you have replicated it, separated, partitioned these resources, then you have a problem now. If a thread is loading uh, from a location that's stored to by another thread, you cannot do this forwarding easily within the pipeline. And Intel had a lot of issues in their initial implementations of hyper-threading in Pentium 4 because of that. They do not have replicate, they do not have a unified load store queue. They partition the load store queue between threads. And they had lots of bugs uh, in their hardware. Uh, and they fixed them gradually, but if they had a unified load store queue, that would have been easier to handle, in my opinion at least. And I think in their opinion now too. <laughs> Okay, but uh, so th these things may not need to be replicated, but they may need to become larger. <laughs> right. So this is a design, if you remember, uh, from 447 and 740. You have a single re physical register file that houses architectural registers, right? So of course, architectural register file needs to be replicated if you have architectural registers. But if you have a physical register file that also houses architectural registers for each thread, you just need to add more registers. Right? You don't need to add more register files because all architectural registers are within this physical register file in addition to the rename registers. 
But this, that, that means that this physical register file needs to become larger as you add more threads. Right. In this case, let's assume that each thread has 32 architectural registers. If you have four of them, you need 128 registers just to house the architectural state. It's a lot of registers. And you need more registers also to uh, be able to rename. Right. So this register file becomes much larger. And that starts becoming the critical path of your machine. So maybe it's a good idea to actually have an architectural register file that's separate from the physical register file if you want to add more thread contexts. OK. So what are some replicated resources versus shared resources? Uh, replicated resources, program counter, obviously, you need to have multiple. Right? Register map, you need to track these register dependencies correctly. And these are uh, for required for correctness reasons. And for performance reasons, you probably want to replicate these. Ha have different resources for each thread, right? You guys remember the return address stack? No nods. Other than people are sleeping. <laughs> What is the function of the return address stack? Yes. I think it's so that if you get like a return call in the code, it basically stores like the previous, it's, it's like a branch predictor almost, yes. except for returning. That's, That's right, yeah. It's, it's basically a target address predictor for return instructions, right? And it turns out people have realized that calls and returns uh, operate like a stack. Right? If you have nested function calls, for example, you do call, 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 and then you return, return, return. And those uh, calls and returns are matched in a stack manner. So when it, when you, whenever you execute a call, the hardware pushes the target address, which is hopefully the address of the next instruction, onto the stack. And whenever you get a return instruction, well, normally return is indirect, right? It's, you need to load from a register the target address. Well, that register is not available until you execute the return. But you would like to get the target address of the return right away to fetch the next instruction. That's the branch prediction problem. So what does the return instruction do? Return instruction looks at the top of that stack, and the hope is that call already loaded that target, and return instruction uses that top of the stack, uh, the target on the top of the stack as the uh, next instruction pointer. That's the idea. Assuming your calls and returns are nicely matched in your program, this has almost 100% prediction accuracy. Why doesn't it have 100% prediction accuracy? Did we have this as a 447 question? Remind me so that we can ask it next semester. <laughs> why, don't, why wouldn't you have 100%? Even if you have perfect matching of calls and returns in your program, you may not get 100% prediction accuracy. Yes? Say it again. Oh, you have some other problems than 100% accuracy. Then. <laughs> You'd better fix those problems first. <laughs> I'm thinking of a program that correctly runs. Yes. That's right, yes. This hardware stack is limited, right? If you have, for example, uh, eight, an eight entry return address stack, you can keep only eight entries here. But if your call depth is, I don't know, maybe 20, what do you do? You cannot store all of the addresses. At some point, you either mispredict or you don't predict anything. Right. Hopefully, you don't predict anything. It's better than mispredict. You can manage your return address stack so that uh, you keep the last few entries and you, do, you don't mispredict. You could also underflow too, right? If your calls and returns are mismatched. But that was not my statement. <laughs> OK. Anyways. We derailed a little bit, but you need to, uh, I hope the reason to replicate this is obvious now. What if you have calls and returns from different threads? You would be return, <laughs> returning to target addresses in a different thread, right? Which may not be a good thing. Okay, that's why you replicate this. Global history register, again, is a similar reason, right? Branches are predicted because you have predictability in the global history of a given thread. Branches from another thread if they modify a single global history register, you have some garbage global history. Because hopefully the execution in one thread has nothing to do with execution in another thread. Make sense? So that is also replicated. 
Do you replicate the entire branch predictor, like pattern history tables? You could, right, because branches, again, have nothing to do with each other from different threads. But that's a big, big, much bigger structure to replicate. Global history register is much smaller. Whereas pattern history tables, uh, a pattern history table is much bigger. Right? If you don't know what I'm talking about, it's a pattern history table is essentially you have a global history register. Let's say this is 10 bits. And you index a table of n bit counters, where n is usually 2 which are saturating counters that tell you what direction should you predict this branch to go to at the, when you have this global history. And this is essentially 2 to the 10 times n bits, which is much larger. But you could actually think about replicating this. But it becomes more complicated if your branch predictor is something different from this. So many machines you, uh, normally do not replicate this. So they have interference here among different threads in the branch predictor. Okay? You could think of other things to be replicated too, but this is one example. Shared resources, register file, this doesn't need to be replicated unless you have architectural registers, register files. But you need to increase its size. The scheduler, you don't need to replicate it because it, should, it can be thread agnostic, again, as I said before. You, you can replicate it always, right? Because once you replicate it, you get more quality of service for a thread. And we will cover that a little bit. First and second level caches, TLBs, and I guess I added the branch predictor here. These are shared. As you increase, as you start partitioning or replicating these, you start looking more like a multi-core processor. I guess iCache also is shared. But you could think about replicating it too. So having this replication versus sharing, or partitioning versus sharing, again, is a balance. What you do affects performance. Once you, once you replicate, uh, or th that means you're partitioning, you cannot use those resources for another thread. Right? So essentially, it's the same trade-off between static versus dynamic partitioning of resources. And we'll see issues related to that. OK, I guess you read this paper, right? So you know what changes to the out of order and superscalar pipeline is needed, at least from this paper. So you can read this. So you can do per thread instruction retirement mechanisms, but you don't have to, again. In this case, they, the machine they evaluated had that. Well, hopefully you have per thread instruction queue flush mechanisms. OK. Anything else that you want? Is this all clear? You read the paper, right? So it's, how, how was the paper, by the way? Was it interesting? Yes? OK, that's good. That's a good paper to assign next year. <laughs> it's always good to read these papers that have affected things. OK. So now that you, have, you know simultaneous multi-threading, let's take a look at its scalability. You may have seen this. I don't remember if this is from that paper or some other paper, but uh, this shows what happens to throughput in terms of instructions per cycle as you increase the number of threads. And you see diminishing returns. And at some point, actually, performance reduces. Maybe to reduce more, but that could be a simulation artifact. Maybe they don't model some things. That's why performance doesn't reduce more. But at some point, yeah, you get diminishing returns. Adding one more thread gives you a lot more performance. I guess in this case, almost 50% performance, a little bit less. Uh, and adding the next thread gives you a little bit less. And adding the next thread gives you incrementally less performance. Why is that? It is not from the paper you read. Why would you get diminishing returns? That's right, yes. Because you have fewer and fewer uh, non-utilized functional units as you add more and more threads, right? To get not diminishing returns, you should be increasing the functional units. You should be increasing the register file. Your resources become limited. 
as you add more threads, you're occupying more resources, so you have less unused resources, fewer unused resources. Okay. There are lots of design considerations in SMT, and the paper you read covered some of these. Uh, now that you have many threads that are executing concurrently, which one do you fetch from? Which one do you prioritize? Uh, these, all of these shared resources, first of all, which one, I guess, I guess, do you make shared versus partitioned? And once you decide to make something shared, how do you prevent starvation? Right. If one thread is hogging uh, your scheduler, how do you prevent that? Uh, how do you maximize throughput? How do you provide some quality of service and fairness? And how do you even decide this, first, first of all? How do you decide to make a resource free for all versus partitioned? How do you measure performance is an interesting issue. In fact, the first paper, is, uh, the ISCA 1995 paper that you were not assigned, uh, used IPC as a performance metric, and its performance results were very, very optimistic. You can go back and take a look at it. Uh, is that the right metric? Is that what you want to optimize for? When you have multiple threads, let's maximize IPC instructions per cycle, regardless of which thread those instructions belong to. Yes? How many people say yes? Zero. Is it because people are not caring or <laughs> how many people say no? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, increasing. How many people abstain and have no clue? <laughs> So the right answer is probably no. <laughs> it is actually no. Although it depends is usually a good answer. <laughs> but I guess it depends. If all of the threads are doing the same thing and you're, you're guaranteeing equal progress, sure. <laughs> but if that's not the case, which is usually not the case, uh, this is not a good metric. Why? I guess those of you who has raised their hand for no, you can tell me why this is not a good metric. You don't get your fairness. Okay. And uh, other thing is, the overall performance of other threads may be dependent. So we should prioritize the critical threads. That's right. That's right. Uh, but IPC may help that also. But then fairness is, a, is an issue. Let's assume threads are independent, totally. <coughs> well, if you want to maximize this metric, basically pr always prioritize the thread that has the highest IPC, right? That's probably a good policy to do. But that may not be a good idea. Wh what about these poor threads that have low IPCs or very low IPCs? OK, so this is something we'll get back to. And how do you select which threads actually should be put together? Operating system has a pool of threads that are active, that are uh, ready to run. Should the operating system decide uh, which threads to co-schedule? And maybe the answer is yes, because threads may interact differently when they're put together on the same processor, when sharing resources so tightly in, a so, in such a fine grain, right? And this is a good paper that you should take a look at, which actually addressed both of these questions. Uh, uh, they have, this is a paper that proposed a weighted speed up metric for, as a more fair measure uh, to measure multi-threaded program performance. Uh, and also they developed mechanisms to find out which threads go well together, which threads are symbiotic when they're placed uh, together on a machine that has SMT, and develop scheduling mechanisms for that. So I'd encourage you to read that. I'd not assign this also, unless you want me to. I can assign it still. Anybody? I guess who'll raise their hand now? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> OK. But this is a, a paper that uh, you would benefit from reading. It's actually one of the better SMT papers. There, there has been a lot of research on SMT uh, since, I think, 1992, it, it got, where it got started. But since 1995 to, oh, well, probably around 2001, 2002, that was the peak of SMT. And then it started going down. Uh, but this is one of the uh, nice papers. OK, so let's take a look at some of these design considerations. Uh, but maybe we should take a break before we continue. Let's do a five-minute break. <laughs> 
Let's get back around 5.30. And then we'll continue. And there are a bunch of them. But the most important thing is, how do you manage the shared resources? Which thread to prioritize? These hopefully you'll read on your own. So which thread to fetch from is uh, an important problem. And people have tackled this for a long time. Uh, one thing you could do is round robin, right? You could change your thread selection policy, just like fine-grain multi-threading. You fetch round robin between threads. Or you could partition the fetch across the threads also, right? You could, you could fetch eight instructions from one thread. Let's say you have an eight wide pipeline. Or you could partition such that you, could, you fetch four instructions from two threads. Or two instructions from four threads. Assume that you have a four-way th four multi-threaded machine. Or you could fetch one instruction from eight threads. Right. You could fetch eight instructions from one thread and round robin across the threads, or one instruction from eight threads every cycle. Right. I guess what are the downsides and upsides of this? If you're fetching wide, from one thread, you need to be able to fetch. A similar issue exists, right, that, that happened in the execution unit. In the fetch, you need to be able to fetch eight instructions from a single thread. Now, if you have branches, this is a wide fetch problem we discussed, right? As you increase the width of your superscalar machine, you need to be able to find useful, effectively uh, useful instructions that can be fetched in one cycle. And this puts pressure on your branch predictor. What if you have a taken branch in the middle? You cannot fetch from a single cache line. Well, even if you don't have a taken branch, you remember that you cannot fetch from a single cache line if, you're, uh, if the beginning uh, of the fetch block, eight instructions you're going to fetch. Some of the instructions are in one ca cache line, and other, instruction, other instructions are in another cache line, right? Even if you uh, don't have a taken branch. Well, what do you do in that case? You fetch from both cache lines. Now, how do you design a cache that supports that? We've discussed this briefly in 740, but not 447. So you may not remember this. But think about, as you increase the width of your machine, eight instructions you want to fetch from a single thread, it's, it becomes more and more likely that those instructions span two cache lines, right? multiple cache lines. So how do you fetch from multiple cache lines at the same time? You could bank the cache, right? And if the cache lines go to different, two different banks, you'll get both. And that's, what, what, that's how uh, Pentium Pro worked. They had the split line fetch. You, even, if, even when they were fetching from a single thread, they needed four instructions from the single thread to fetch. And they basically at a split line fetch. They could fetch from either a single cache line if the instruction started from the beginning or beginning half of the cache line, or they could fetch the end of the cache line plus the beginning of the next cache line in a single cycle if the instruction's beginning address happened to be at the end of a cache line, at the second half of a cache line. That's called split line fetch. And you can think about different ways of supporting it. Uh, I won't go into that. But you, you have this problem if you're fetching multiple instructions from a single thread. Now, let's take a look at how would you support fetching multiple instructions from uh, multiple threads? Now, the problem is even worse, right? Because if you're fetching multiple instructions from a single thread, you know you're fetching from this cache line plus the next cache line, unless you have a taken branch. That complicates the problem. <laughs> if you have multiple instructions from multiple threads, now you have multiple program counters that have nothing to do with each other. So do you multi-port your cache, iCache? Do you want to share the iCache? Probably, because there are benefits to sharing if, you're, if your program actually shares code. And also, you don't need to replicate. You don't need to statically partition your cache across threads. So if you're fetching one instruction from eight threads, then you need eight ports. You may have eight banks, but you can have bank conflicts then. 
So it's a good idea to think about the complexity of the fetch engine when you have multiple threads. It turns out, like many processors that are really designed, opted with this option, which is more instructions from a single thread rather than fewer instructions from multiple threads. Because fewer instructions from multiple threads, that requires kind of multi-porting or banking, which leads to bank conflicts, right? Or you partition your iCache, but there, there are downsides to that as well. So if you look at many SMT processors today, they do this. Power five, well, I guess it's power seven now, <laughs> or maybe power eight at some point. Power five used to be this way, uh, eight instructions from one thread. Uh, Intel's processors you are this way, n instructions from one thread. Where, but the evaluations you see in the papers are usually uh, pointing out multiple instructions from multiple threads, right? I think the best evaluation, I don't remember, but maybe eight instructions from two threads or two instru uh, four instructions from two threads each. Four instructions each from two threads. So the, the reason is complexity, essentially. Yes? Is instruction fetches regularly like less time consuming compared to inhibition that you could potentially run the fetch unit at a higher frequency and fetch more? Like, <coughs> like, mm -hmm. Would it put twice, twice as fast? So well, that's, that's usually harder because you have a critical path in the fetch unit, right? Which is the branch prediction loop. <laughs> so you need to predict your branch in the next cycle to figure out what you're going to fetch from. <laughs> So that, that tends to be. Usually fetch units are actually run slowly. For example, Pentium 4 uh, was able to fetch six micro operations from a single thread. But it actually executed only three downstream. So it was a three white machine later on. So it fetched every other cycle from a single thread and would supply six instructions. OK, so think about this. If you increase the number of instructions, you run into the branch prediction problem. You fetch fewer things, probably, from a single thread. But if you increase the number of threads, now your complexity becomes harder. So maybe the solution, if you have, if you're, if you have a 32-wide engine, then probably 32 instructions from one thread is not a good answer. Then you may want to have partitioning a little bit, or fetching from multiple threads. Okay. So these are static policies. So static policies, uh, actually, I think this is kind of independent. One static policy is round robin. I should, I should fix this, because this is really the num how many threads you fetch from and how many instructions you fetch. I, sh I wouldn't call this static policies. It's really uh, round robin is a static policy. Which thread do you favor? You can round robin. Or you could have more dynamic policies, like favor threads with minimal in-flight branches. Which thread do you actually fetch from? Or favorite threads with minimal outstanding misses or minimal number of in-flight instructions? Can you identify the reasoning behind these? You read the paper. Why would you want to fetch from uh, threads that have mi minimal in-flight branches? Yes? Mm -hmm. Fewer branches, hopefully means that fewer mispredicted branches also. And if you have a mispredicted branch, that means you're going to throw away some of the work. You might as well fetch from a thread that's not going to throw, throw away work. Right? That's the intuition. Of course, you can improve this, as we've discussed brief, briefly earlier. Maybe, maybe you have a confidence associated with each branch. right? You have branch confidence estimation. Uh, and that's another paper you should read if you haven't done so yet. <laughs> This is uh, Jacobson et al. That's, that, is be, that is used in many processors, assigning confidence to conditional branch predictors. Basically, the hardware, when it predicts a branch, uh, it not only decides this is the direction the conditional branch will go to, but it also has a bit saying, oh, I'm confident or not confident about this prediction I've made. And you can adapt the processor policies based on that confidence, right? It's micro 1996. And 
one way of adapting the processor policy is based on the confidence is co count how many non-confident branches you have in the pipeline for a given thread and prioritize a thread that has the minimal number of non-confident branch predictions. Right? So it's better than this counting just number of branches because if you count the number of branches, all of the branches may be easy to predict. Right? That doesn't help. But if the, this confidence, if that measure is reasonable, uh, then you can do better. Okay, and you can have similar reasoning here. And I guess we'll see some of this. We'll see actually this policy, minimal in-flight instructions. You, you read it in the paper. This is called the I count policy. I guess why would you want to do that? <laughs> you have, uh, let's say you have the count of all instructions in the machine and you have the count of instructions per thread that are in the machine and prioritize the fetch of the thread that has the fewest number of instructions in the back end. Yes? Isn't it like that's the most likely to be making quick progress through the machine? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the insight. That's the reason. This is making progress, so let's bring in more instructions. And hopefully they will make progress also. Whereas the others probably have more instructions because they're stalling. That's an indirect way of detecting stalls or make, uh, detecting slow progress. Okay? And you could say the same thing about this, right? If you have outstanding misses, you're less likely to be making progress. But there are implications, of course, of all these policies on performance and fairness. And we'll look at that. Okay, which instruction to select and dispatch? This is an easier question, hopefully because you have the out of order scheduling logic, which is data flow based, this can be thread agnostic. And you actually would like this to be thread agnostic because this is one of the critical paths in an out of order machine, right? If you add a thread selection logic over there, you in, in, in increase your critical path. Okay. Yeah, so if you look at the round robin policy, you fetch from a different thread each cycle, this doesn't work well in practice. Uh, well, because I guess I should have asked this, but here's the reason. <laughs> because you, you may have instructions from a slow thread, and if you're round, fetching round robin, you're always fetching from that thread, right? Let's say a thread is stalling. It cannot commit instructions because it's stalling for thousands of cycles. Uh, and if you keep fetching round robin, if that thread is able to fetch instructions, you'll bring in instructions from that thread, and those instructions would occupy the resources, fill up the resources, and they would hog the pipeline, and other threads will not be able to use those resources. Right. Execution units may be idle, but you don't have enough buffering in the instruction scheduler. scheduler once the scheduler becomes full, you cannot schedule from any thread. Right. Okay, we've seen this somewhere else before, right? <laughs> this is a problem in a single threaded machine also. You cannot bring in more instructions if you're stalling because of a load from one thread. Uh, and that's, that's a problem in a single thread machine, uh, but it's a bigger problem here because you may actually have independent instructions from independent threads that can execute, but you're still not utilizing your machine well. Okay, so I count, we briefly talked about basically fetch from the thread with the least instructions in earlier pipeline stages or even later pipeline stages. And this improves throughput because now you're enabling these hopefully fast threads to make more progress, bringing more instructions from those fast threads. So it favors faster threads that have few instructions that are waiting. So the advantage of a round robin is higher IPC throughput, right? If a thread has long latency instructions, uh, these other threads can make progress while these threads are being deprioritized in the fetch stage. The disadvantage is, is this fair? <laughs> You're saying no. <laughs> you want the slow threads to make progress. And that's a, that's a good point. I guess I should have another question here. Well, it's, this is prone to short-term starvation, right, also. Because you may not be fetching from these threads that happen to have a little bit more instructions. So it's prone to starvation. It's also not fair, but it may not also be the highest performance way. You may manage your resources better. Right. And we'll look at some other policies to fix that. 
Okay, some results on this. This is from the paper. Is this from the paper you read? Does this look familiar? Okay, good. Uh, I'll not cover this. You can read this, but this is looking at how many no how many instructions you fetch. Mm. I guess from one thread, eight instructions. From two threads, four instructions. And from four threads, two instructions. And from two threads, eight instructions, right? And they found, I guess, obviously, fetching two threads from eight instructions, uh, eight instructions each is better. Yeah. That doesn't sound fair, though. <laughs> is it? Here you're fetching eight instructions per cycle. Here you're fetching 16 instructions per cycle. And there was a reasoning in the paper, which I, I do not remember now. Since you guys read the paper much more recently than I did, do you remember the reasoning? You do? That's right. Now I remember. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, they, they assumed that I think you could bank the iCache better and still be able to fetch two instructions, uh, eight instructions from each thread. But that's true for. Uh, I mean, you could argue that's everywhere, probably. <laughs> okay, anyway. And this is the comparison between some other policies. Prioritize the thread that has fewer branches. Prioritize the thread that has fewer misses. Prioritize the, prioritize the thread that has fewer instructions in the pipeline. And that happens to have the highest IPC throughput. And again, remember, this is IPC. Other metrics may not be the best. And IQ position, I don't remember. I think that was related to the position of the thread. Anybody remember that? No? That could be a good test question, huh? <laughs> since you read the paper. <laughs> That'll force me to read the paper again. <laughs> okay. Okay, so one of the issues uh, in single thread performance, as well as multi-thread performance, is long latency loads. Long latency loads things that block the instruction and scheduling windows for a long time uh, cause a problem in a single-threaded processor because once you have a long latency load, first of all, the instruction window, you cannot retire instructions. And if, there, if you have dependent instructions on the long latency load, a lot of dependent instructions, your scheduling window becomes blocked also because you're not scheduling instructions, right? They're just sitting in your reservation stations. And these cause the processor to stall because of this. It could be either a full window stall or it could be a scheduling window stall. In SMT, this is a bigger problem because now a long latency load can block the window for all threads. Right? It's not only one thread you're affecting. It's all threads that you're affecting. And it's kind of bad because SMT is there to utilize these idle cycles that happen because of these stalls. And think of it this way. Uh, if you think of it, these stalls are now causing, reducing the latency tolerance that you gain from SMT like a chicken, and, uh, you, you're, you're, sol you're, you're providing a solution to the problem which is affected by the same problem. <laughs> so how do you solve this problem? Uh, so I guess this, is, this kind of shows the problem here. Again, the metric is IPC, y-axis instructions per cycle across all threads. Uh, and they uh, this paper classified mm, workloads in terms of ILP versus MEM. ILP means compute intensive. MEM means memory intensive. And if you look at this, uh, I guess there are two threads. If you look at this one, when the memory thread runs, it's making very slow progress. Its IPC is very low. When the ILP thread, compute intensive thread runs, its IPC is three or so. When you put them together, the overall IPC drops to very small, closer to uh, the lower end. That's the problem, basically. This, this thread, memory thread, is blocking resources, hogging resources, such that the ILP thread, compute intensive thread, which would otherwise make progress, is not making progress because it's not getting the resources it needs. And this is evident when you mix these threads that have very disparate compute or memory intensity, intensities. So how do you solve it? Many people have actually proposed solutions to this. I have my favorite solution which you may have guessed, but <laughs> we'll get to that. One solution is, any ideas? I guess I'll take ideas. <laughs> All right, no idea. 
So one solution in this paper is why not flush the thread that incurs an L2 cache miss? That would enable, basically, if a thread is getting lots of L2 cache miss, you keep flushing it, flushing the instructions, getting it out of the pipeline until its L2 cache miss is satisfied. I guess reasonable if you want the other thread to make progress. Right? The downside is now you're, you could be flushing that thread a lot, right? You're basically wasting a lot of cycles because of that flushing to make compute intensive threads to make progress. And they've showed benefits in this paper uh, uh, from that. You can read that. Another solution is not flushing, but a different solution, which actually makes some uh, sense if you can do it well. Uh, basically, when you fetch instructions from a thread, you fetch a load from decode state, you consult a predictor. That predictor says, are you going to miss in the cache? If the answer is yes, this load is going to miss in the cache, then uh, this mechanism doesn't insert the following instructions from that thread into the scheduler. So it's basically predicting the stalls before they happen. Because if you predict the stall before it happens, then you have not occupy the resources downstream in the pipeline. Right? And if you have enough buffering in the front end, you can have per thread buffering in the front end, because you could be that's not, those are not critical parts of the pipeline. You can have lots of FIFOs for different threads. Because you're not, uh, the, the critical resources are actually in the middle when you allocate the registers, when you, uh, the reservation stations are critical resources because you need to do a complex content addressable matching, right? So if you predict before you allocate registers and before you allocate reservation station entries, before you allocate load store buffer entries, that a load is going to miss then stall that thread for a while. That way you preserve those precious resources for other threads that are not going to miss. Right. Of course, now you, you hopefully have a question. When do you figure out that that load is not a miss? <laughs> so you execute that load. You send that load, but not, not the following instructions. You somehow need to figure out <laughs> that load is a miss or a hit, right? OK. And they've, so they've shown uh, performance improvements uh, on this. One other idea is to actually not do very heavy resource sharing, which also makes sense. Uh, well, I guess, the, what is the downside of this? Anybody? You guys are silent today. I have a question regarding this. Huh? If you do not dispatch the thread with load, how did you ever get the latency of the load covered? So the, you, you send the load instruction, and if it misses the cache, you don't dispatch. You, the latency is tolerated by other threads. You have other threads to execute. Okay, so you just send the load instruction and not the instruction following. That's right, exactly. What is the downside? This sounds like a good thing to do, right? What is the hard problem here? That's not that bad. The oh, okay. Is it the hardware complexity or whether or not you can predict it? <laughs> so it's a tough prediction to do, it turns out, whether or not you're going to miss in the cache. It's a tough thing to do, especially if your cache misses are rare events. Right? It's, it's actually an interesting research problem. If you can find a way of predicting whether or not you're going to miss in the cache that would, with high accuracy, that, that would be useful for many, many reasons, not only for this reason. But it's a rare event. Let's say your prediction, uh, you hit in your cache 98% of the time. How do you predict that 2%? It's difficult to do. One other idea is to partition the shared resources such that a thread's load, long latency instruction doesn't affect any other thread. But now you're losing some of the benefits of SMT. Right? And SMT, one of the biggest benefits is shared resource utilization. Now, if you're partitioning resources, then you're not improving utilization. You're becoming more like a multi chip multiprocessor. And this paper is a good paper that discusses this, actually, different ways of partitioning resources. Uh, that's an idea I like more. <laughs> uh, the idea is predict if uh, this, this is improving upon this idea. These are three different ideas, and this idea improves upon the first idea. Instead of flushing 
a thread right away, predict whether or not executing that thread for a while will give you benefits because you will uncover some load misses. Right? And if you actually uh, know that, if, if a thread actually has that MLP, memory level parallelism, to tolerate the load miss, issue those loads and flush the thread after its MLP is exploited. So one problem with this, if you flush the thread, that whenever it gets a cache misses, you're not executing other load instructions from that thread that may also miss. And when you come back to that thread, those instructions are executed and you'll flush the pipeline again. And when you come back again, you'll flush the pipeline again because the other load that you could have executed because you have an instruction window misses. So this solves that problem. And they have a nice MLP predictor. You can take a look at this paper. I think I had assigned it last year, but this year I didn't assign it. And there are a bunch of other solutions that I did not put down here. You can take a look at uh, the reference parts, uh, references of these papers. I guess this is some data from this last paper. They evaluate all these different approaches. Predictive stall fetch is this one, I believe. Uh, but anyway, they've showed that MLP aware flush is the best uh, policy. Basically, flushing after a thread has exploited its MLP, me memory level parallelism, is the best policy. And that prediction is hard to do in this mechanism. That's why it doesn't perform too well. Okay. So what other solution exists here? That's an idea I had for a long time, and uh, it only required someone to <laughs> just implement it. And the idea is simple, right? Why don't you do a run ahead? on one thread, <laughs> then you don't have this problem. Right? The problem goes away because the thread is not blocking anymore your resources. Right? Your thread is really, uh, if, a, if, a, if you get a long latency cache miss, you're just running ahead and never blocking. In general, this is a good way of designing systems. You're not blocking, you're not blocking yourself, you're not blocking others. Now you may not get benefit from run ahead but even then, the performance, it turns out, improves because you're allowing other threads to make progress now. Does that make sense? So you already know run ahead, so I won't go into detail. Basically, you can improve both single thread performance when you're benefiting from run ahead, and also improve multi-thread performance because you're allowing other threads to use the resources. Of course, now you can say you can do even better, right? You can you can predict if run ahead will do well. You can have a predictor, and you've seen those predictors when we talked about efficient run ahead execution. If the run ahead, is, run ahead execution is going to provide benefits, you can predict that. If so, then the thread uh, that's stalled for an L2 cache miss will not stall, but you do run ahead on that until run ahead becomes useless. Maybe you can predict that also. And this, uh, these two papers try to do that. Else. If the runahead is not going to do well, uh, well, there should be an MLP here. Then you can exploit the memory level parallelism, just like this paper described, and flush the thread afterwards. Right. Does that make sense? It seems like this is the best policy so far <laughs> in terms of managing long latency loads in a multi-threaded, simultaneous multi-threaded processor. Predict if run ahead will do well. If so, run ahead on that. Otherwise, exploit memory level parallelism and flush the thread when you get an L3 cache miss or long latency cache miss. It could be an L3 cache miss as you've seen in Montecito. Okay. Maybe you can come up with an even better mechanism than this. Okay. So let's take a look at some commercial MLP, uh, SMT implementations. And actually, if you look at um, I guess IBM Power 6 is also SMT, although I don't want to call it SMT fully. Uh, okay, Intel Pentium 4, uh, I believe, was the first processor that had SMT, simultaneous multi-threading. Uh, they called it hyper-threading, <laughs> I guess, which is a hype <laughs> for, <laughs> hype name for something that already exists. Uh, 
And IBM Power 5 is, was one of the first ones also. I guess today most IBM, most Intel and AMD processors are simultaneously multi-threaded, right? I haven't kept up with the AMD processors, but. Oh, they're not? Okay. At some point they were, they had this clustered multi-threading. Do they have it now? That's right, that was different. Mm -hmm. hmm. Okay, I don't keep up with the AMD processors very well, I guess, because they don't publish a lot of this information in at least academic journals. But that's good to know. But Intel processors are simultaneously multi-threaded, right? Okay, anyway, you can, you can fill in these. Uh, we'll, we'll get back to Pentium 4, uh, but IBM Power 5, uh, they have a good description actually in this paper uh, about how they do the multi-threading. And also in their uh, IBM Journal and Research and uh, Journal of Research and Development paper, which is 30, 40 pages. But essentially, what they have is similar to what you've described. They replicate the program counter, return address stack, and I believe branch history tables. They have multiple instruction buffers for different threads, and they have thread priority logic. And here, nothing is replicated in between. They replicate the group completion tables, which are the reorder buffers and the store queues. And uh, they actually have priority support in their multi-threading, uh, simultaneous multi-threading. So you can adjust decode cycles dedicated to the thread based on the priority level. What is decode cycles? Uh, I guess it's this part. Which thread do you send to the decoder? Or how many instructions from which thread do you send to this decoder? That's the thread priority. And that priority level is uh, depicted here from that paper. Basically one thread can have Threads can have equal priorities, in which case you get, I guess, four instructions from each. I guess it's a pictorial thing, so it's not basic. It's, it's really the IPC that you get. A, a thread uh, can have zero priority, and another can have priority seven, in which case you keep fetching from that thread that has the highest priority. And software can control this priority. Why would you want to do this? Again, it's the same issue that we discussed, right? If a thread is in a spin loop waiting for a lock, the software can say, reduce my priority. Right. Mm. And if one application is more important than the other, then operating system can tell this. If you still want throughput, maybe you give low priority to that application that doesn't need, uh, isn't as important to the user. So this is a good, actually there is another paper I think in ISCA uh, 2008 that evaluates the thread priority support. Okay. So they do thread throttling. Uh, that's how they manage the fairness and performance uh, across different threads. And they throttle under two conditions. Uh, they figure out, uh, they have this resource balancing logic that detects when a thread has more than some number of misses in the L2 cache. And also they look at the number of misses in the translation look at, look at side buffer. If those misses are greater than some number, they throttle the thread. And we'll cover about how they throttle the thread. And again, if a thread is using too many reorder buffer entries, again, they throttle the thread down. This is similar to kind of I count, right? And this is similar to what we've discussed before. How do they do that? They reduce the priority of the thread. That's one way. They also inhibit the instruction decoding until this is from their paper, they call it congestion. And they also do this flushing mechanism, flush all threads instructions. Uh, and they stop the thread basically from executing until <coughs> congestion clears. And you can read the, what congestion clears means. I don't think they want to give out everything. <laughs> That's why they call it congestion clears. Make sense? So these mechanisms that we've described are actually implemented in some existing processors. And IBM Power 6, which is also multi-threaded, it's not exact, it's, it's also simultaneously multi-threaded, but their mechanisms are not clear in their descriptions. Uh, they do run ahead. And when, uh, so when they get a long latency cache miss, both threads can go. In fact, uh, sometimes if they don't have enough threads, uh, what they do is they, they have two thread contexts, they copy one context to the other one, and they do run ahead on one context, and the other context is basically waiting for the load miss. So that when you come back from run ahead, you start from the other context that you already have. 
That's if you have only one thread in the machine. This is Pentium 4. Uh, I guess it's hard to look at. There's a lot more partitioning in Pentium 4. Remember, this was the first implementation of uh, simultaneous multi-threading. Intel was criticized a lot, saying that this is not real multi-threading because you partitioned all of the resources almost across threads. Uh, and if you can see that a lot of things are actually partitioned. If I, so U op queue, micro op queues are partitioned uh, across threads. Other queues are partitioned. Scheduler is not partitioned and the register file is not partitioned because partitioning that would really uh, reduce your frequency. Uh, and store buffer is partitioned and reorder buffer is partitioned also. So a thread cannot utilize all of the resources of the machine uh, when, it, when, it's, when it's running together with another thread. Mm. Okay, and they call this hyper-threading. You can read about this. This is actually an interesting paper to read in Intel Technology Journal. Uh, and they report some uh, results. Uh, oh, how do they handle long latency loads? Uh, they don't, uh, they, uh, if you remember, we briefly discussed how Pentium 4 handles long latency loads, right? When you get a long latency load in Pentium 4, uh, what happens is you have a second level scheduling queue. The long latency load and its dependent instructions are taken out of this, where is the scheduler? I'm looking for the scheduler. Oh, there you go, the scheduler. <laughs> are taken out of the small scheduler. It's not shown here, but put into a bigger scheduler that you not search. It's a FIFO queue. And they wait there until uh, the load comes back from memory. So that way, load, a load and its dependence, that, a load that misses in the cache and its dependence does not block the scheduler. So other instructions can come in and can get scheduled. So that's, a, mm, that's one way of designing a machine that's more latency tolerant, right? You don't block on a long latency cache miss. That way you don't necessarily need to flush the pipeline, right? Because this buffer, the hope is that that buffer, the second level of the scheduler, can be much simpler, right? Because you don't need to do uh, tag matching whenever you broadcast an instruction. What happens is when the load comes back, it wakes up the entry at the head of that queue, and you start bringing in those instructions back into the small scheduler. Basically, it's a, they call this the scheduling loops. So you have the small scheduler. If you get a cache miss, well, you either go to the execution unit, or if you get a cache miss, you go back to this FIFO, second level scheduler. This is also called the, it's not exactly the same thing, but there's a paper called Waiting Instruction Buffer. I think it was published in ISCA 2001, but maybe it's 2002, which was written after this was implemented. And the load and its dependent instructions go here. When the load completes, this FIFO is drained back into the scheduler so that now hopefully you can execute. But this is a FIFO. Remember, it, it, you basically check the head of this. So when the load completes, it doesn't mean that everything in the FIFO is completed. So for, let's say you have multiple loads that missed. Load one, load two. You start draining this FIFO, and you will drain this FIFO for a while, and this load two, when it executes, you figure out that it's a miss again. So you, you put back that load and it's dependent into the FIFO again. So this is, you may hear this, but this is called the replay loop. <laughs> You're basically replaying instructions. And this caused a lot of problems in the design of Pentium 4. Uh, this was one of the critical paths, in fact. I cannot point to you to a good paper, unfortunately. <laughs> okay. But that's how they handle the long latency loads. This way, a thread's long latency load, or any thread's long latency load, doesn't necessarily block other threads. The problem is, of course, you have this bad scheduling decisions, potentially, because you don't have a big scheduler. Okay. So they had many more partition structures. They partitioned the TLBs. They partitioned the instruction queues, store buffer, reorder buffer. And their area overhead was 5%, just because of adding SMT into the design. 
And this is their performance results uh, on workloads that are relatively parallel, web servers and Java. Uh, they got 20% performance gain. And that's, that seems like a good trade-off, right? 5% area overhead, 20% performance gain. Okay. Maybe we should stop here, but maybe I'll, I'll cover this briefly so that we can uh, figure out uh, you have a good outline of what we will cover next. So now that, oh, any questions before that, by the way? I'd encourage you to read uh, this paper. That doesn't talk about all of these details, but this is uh, fun to know. How, how machines actually uh, design their real schedulers, or how architects have designed real machine schedulers. If you want to learn a little bit more about something similar to this, you should look at waiting instruction buffer paper. And there are some harder to read papers after that, but I wouldn't recommend them. <laughs> okay, so now that we have this multi-threading hardware, people uh, became creative. They wanted to use it for other things, right? Whenever you have new hardware for some other, for some reason, in this case, resource utilization reasons, you can imagine new ways of using it, right? Uh, and you read a paper that talks about redundant execution to tolerate soft errors, right? In multi-threading, was that interesting? That's an interesting topic. That was not the first paper. There was a paper before that, but I assigned you that one. Uh, you could do implicit parallelization. This is not necessarily enabled by multi-threading. Whenever you have multiple processors, people have been fascinated by this topic. Can you take a single-threaded program and parallelize it across multiple processors? Now, multi-threading helps that a lot more, right? That's why people have become more interested in it when you had multi-threading, because you have this very tight communication that can happen between two threads or between n threads where n threads are executing on the same processor. Right? So you don't have this latency, long latency to communicate between the threads. So this could enable this implicit parallelization techniques and we'll look at that. You read another paper that talked about helper threading without calling it helper threading. For example, you could have helper threads that prefetch for the main thread. And that's again useful because you're using the same pipeline for prefetching. You're utilizing hopefully the idle cycles to do useful work for the same thread. And the other benefit is you're executing this prefetch thread on the same processor, so you're prefetching right into the L2 cache or L into the data cache. And you could use this for exception handling, right? Instead of switching to an exception handler, if you have a single threaded processor, now you can handle the exception seamlessly on the other thread context. That way you don't need to flush the pipeline. Right? This is similar to context switching, right? Otherwise you would need to switch your context to the system context to handle the exception. That's true for interrupt handling also. Okay, I think I'll stop here and then uh, next time we'll start with uh, this part. Yes. Have a good weekend.